Well, speaking of UKIP, uh, they may have got the third highest tally of votes in the general election, if not the prize for geography. Um, they did get almost four million votes, but they ended up with only one MP, and it wasn't Nigel Farage. Within half an hour of hearing he'd missed out, Mr Farage resigned as party leader, honouring a promise that he'd made that he would quit if he failed to make it into Westminster. But he hasn't ruled out quite having another go. Here he is speaking on Friday morning. There hasn't been a single day of my life since 1994 that has not been dominated by UKIP. Um, I've tried to mix that with family. I tried for nine years to mix it with running my own business. Uh, and it really has been seven days a week, totally unrelenting uh, and occasionally let down by people uh, who perhaps haven't always said and done the right things. Um, so I feel uh, a huge weight has been lifted off my shoulders. I haven't had a fortnight's holiday since October 1993. Uh, I intend to take the summer off. Um, enjoy myself a little bit, uh, not do very much politics at all, um, and there will be a leadership election uh, for the next leader of UKIP in September, and I will consider over the course of this summer whether to put my name forward to do that job again. Now, uh, Jafar well, he hasn't taken that two weeks off yet because I think he was on breakfast television this yeah. morning. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we're joined by UKIP's sole MP, the former Conservative Douglas Carswell, UKIP MP now for Clacton. I uh, got re elected uh, on that. Uh, You've decided not to go for the leadership That's yourself. Right. Uh, do you have an idea yet who you would like to be the UKIP leader? Well, I think there are four or five very good uh, people. Um, Paul Nuttall, Suzanne Evans, Patrick O'Flynn, Diane James, Stephen Wolfe. These are people who've fought and won um, seats in the European Parliament, who, who, who have a, 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 a different perspective on, on the way forward. And I think we need to listen to them and make a considered decision. So you haven't made your mind up yet. No, I haven't. But they, I think all of them bring real qualities. Is there not at the back of your mind a fear that that was it for you, Kip? That it's essentially over an insurgent party that simply in the end didn't surge? No, I don't think that's the case, because the things that drive UKIP are fundamentally a, a feeling of disconnect between the, the voters and the political establishment. And without political reform, that's not going to go away. And the need for this, this alternative to the Tweedledee versus Tweedledum is very strong. We've seen it in Scotland, actually. I mean, the, the, the alternative to Tweedledee, Tweedledum uh, are, are the SNP. That feeling of disaffection isn't going to stop um, at uh, but, the, the border, or but, Hadrian's Wall, you might say. But <laughs> contrary to all uh, informed punditry, England has essentially gone back to a two-party system. <laughs> We thought we'd move to a multi-party system, but in terms of seats, which in our constitution is what matters, of it's course, a two-party system. Of course, of course, the rules written by the political establishment rig it so that it favours the cartel. Um, all sorts of things... Well, it didn't favour it in Scotland. All, all, all sorts of things favour the uh, established parties. But in terms of voter share... I think we see a, a, a growth in support for alternatives. Now, it's slightly skewed by the collapse of the Lib Dem vote, but a lot of that Lib Dem vote came our way, and I think we've seen an extraordinary number of people in England and Wales voting for a radical alternative. I, I, I don't think the two-party system is looking too healthy. Perhaps the, the, the dysfunctional electoral system, which produces Tweedledee right. and Tweedledum, is intact, but it's not going to be intact for much longer. Well, I would suggest to you it's going to be intact at least until 2020, because, I mean, I, I can well see why you UK would want some kind of proportional representation. You, you got almost four million votes well, and you, I... got, you got one MP. But I don't for the life of me see how you're going to get electoral reform this side of 2020. Oh, when I was a Conservative MP, I tabled amendments with Caroline Lucas in favour of STV, the sort of multi-member system. Yeah. And I think the case for that is going to become uh, pretty... I'm not arguing about the case, I'm arguing about the practicality of getting uh, uh, sure. it. You won't get it this side let's, of 2020. Let's face it. Even if we got reform this week, it's not going to change the outcome of the last election. I, I grant you that. But the agenda that uh, our demands for political reform, I think, is going to, going to get louder and stronger. We, we need not just electoral reform. We need a power to recall MPs. We need open primary candidate selection. We need, a, we need shorthand for this is direct democracy. We need to move away from this deferential system of democracy where we leave it to a political clique, and we need much more direct democracy. And I think demand for that in a country that's used to endless self-selection with the Internet is going to grow. Well, I wonder if it is in the end, because of the, I hear what you say, and you're very passionate about it, but let's just look at the situation. The Lib Dems, who often care about a lot of these things too, they're down to eight MPs. 
I don't think it's too much of a going out on a limb to say the Labour Party, as it rebuilds itself, is not going to get hooked on constitutional reform. It has to I... engage with Middle England and Middle uh, Scotland. Oh, so, and the SNP, who theoretically are in favour of they PR, are... why would they really, when but on this things. system, yeah. with 50% of the vote, they got 95% put, put, of the MPs? Put, put, put aside narrow party uh, partisanship. I, I just wonder if the left in this country is about to rediscover the sort of the, that sort of democratic tradition that it's lost sight of. If they don't, it's going to be great news for UKIP because we can make big inroads. But I, I, I suspect that there will be candidates for the Labour leadership who believe in electoral reform and direct democracy too. So I think things are about to get very interesting. What do you think of the position of UKIP now, Ken? Well, I understand it when you get one MP for four million votes, and I actually back electoral reform. There was a referendum. We got hammered <laughs> two, uh, two to one. And I, you've got to win on the current system in order to introduce it. And, and I actually think it would be wrong for the Conservatives to uh, introduce it now because it wasn't in the manifesto. They didn't promise it. Now, I'd celebrate with you, Douglas, if the Conservatives in their 2020 manifesto, along with Labour, Lib Dems, your good selves, everybody puts it in. But, but I think it's a, very unlikely, because there's always a vested interest. Your vested interest is reform, sure. their vested interest sure. is no it's, reform. But it's a long march. It's mm. a long march. It's a, yeah. <laughs> the, I think it would be like the Bataan death march. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody makes it in the end. But How very optimistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hardy's party started small. Yeah, Hardy's party started small, and, and mm. you know. Some would say it's getting small again. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, perhaps now wasn't the best time to use that analogy. Yes. <laughs> Doug is absolutely right to say that there are 3.7 million voters, apart from what, the 20,000 or 30,000 who voted for, for Douglas and Clacton, mm. who've lost their votes. Completely disappeared. That has got to be a mm. massive problem. 12% of the electorate, whatever mm. it is, huge problem whoever is governing the country. Well, it is when you look at the number of MPs the SNP got. Mm. But, however, uh, however, you can, there you is... You've got a, more than the SNP and the Liberal Democrats combined. You, you but, needed 3.9 million votes to get one MP. I think they got an MP for every 23,000 or 24,000. I was going to say... Mm. David Cameron has an opportunity here, and this is to do the Labour Party. Is that you know what are the things that really upset people who voted UKIP? Uh, arrogance, politics, special advisors running the country, the much problems elite, Europe, immigration. All those problems, may, they'll still be there in some shape or form, but they may not be as acute mm. by 2020. Cameron could sort out the EU thing, he could win back some powers on, on immigration. Boundary reform's going to help. I mean, boundary reform is likely to go ahead. I would say yes. support boundary oh, no, reform. Does that, 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 that help you? Oh, of course it does. Because, because well, look at the just proportionate representation that the SNP got compared to UKIP. Anything that recalibrates the number of seats to make them more proportionate the, is going to be good for UKIP. There will be quite a number of issues in which the government can count on your support, I would suggest. I'm going to be pragmatic about it. I'm going to be absolutely consistent with my <laughs> free market um, classical liberal philosophy. I wouldn't rely on a new peer for Clacton, I would suggest. I, I'm, or a, I'm, 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 a, a, fast, a, a new a peer, bypass. you mean something that, that, that you have uh, rides on rather than uh, something yeah. House of Lords. <laughs> yeah. Something that juts out into the sea. <laughs> Good, for a moment, I'm a little there. bit of money going Clacton's way. No, no, no. I don't, I don't do. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do pork barrel politics. No. But, you know, there are certain things where I think I'm going to agree. Boundary change I will agree with the government on because we need it. Um, and, and the European referendum. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think there are all sorts of things where I will support a, a sensible left-wing opposition. I said to you yesterday, and I'm still not quite sure what the answer is, that if we, if it looks, it looks like we are now going to have a referendum uh, and either we'll vote to stay in or we'll vote to come out. Either way, I'm not quite sure what the future of UKIP is after that. Well, I think that there's a huge need for an alternative, a party that believes in local... It's not just about bringing powers back home from Brussels and leaving them in Westminster. I think we need a, a localist revolution. We need direct democracy to replace the system of deferential uh, 18th century representative democracy. We need to get rid of the rotten borough system that we've got. So there's a huge agenda. Coming out of the European Union is just the beginning of the change this country needs. But uh, if, if we're prepared to be classically uh, liberal and free market, I think uh, the sky's the limit. OK. Thank you very much. You. So after five years of ministerial cars and government red boxes, the Liberal Democrats suffered a catastrophe on Thursday night 